The Desire of Ages, Chapter 33, Who Are My Brethren? There are none so hardened as those who have slighted the invitation of mercy and done despite to the Spirit of Grace. The most common manifestation of the sin against the Holy Spirit is in persistently slighting heaven's invitation to repent. The most common manifestation of the sin against the Holy Spirit is in persistently slighting heaven's invitation to repent. Repent, dear friend, the end is near. In rejecting Christ, the Jewish people committed the unpardonable sin. And by refusing the invitation of mercy, we may commit the same error. We offer insult to the Prince of Life and put him to shame before the synagogue of Satan and before the heavenly universe when we refuse to listen to his delegated messengers. And instead listen to the agents of Satan who would draw the soul away from Christ. So long as one does this, he cannot, he can find no hope but pardon, and he will finally lose all desire to be reconciled to God. While Jesus was still teaching the people, his disciples brought the message that his mother and his brothers were without and desired to see him. He knew what was in their hearts, and he answered and said unto him that told him, Who is my mother, and who are my brethren? And he stretched forth his hand toward his disciples, and said, Behold my mother and my brethren, for whosoever shall do the will of my Father which is in heaven, the same is my brother and sister and mother. All who would receive Christ by faith were united to him by a tie closer than that of human kinship. They would become one with him as he was one with the Father. As a believer and doer of his words, his mother was more nearly and savingly related to him than through her natural relationship. His brothers would receive no benefit from their connection with him unless they accepted him as their personal savior. What a support Christ would have found in his earthly relatives if they had believed in him as one from heaven and had cooperated with him in doing the work of God. Their unbelief cast a shadow over the earthly life of Jesus. It was a part of the bitterness of that cup of woe which he drained for us. The enmity kindled in the human heart against the gospel was keenly felt by the Son of God and it was most painful to him in his home. For his own heart was full of kindness and love, and he appreciated tender regard in the human relation. His brothers desired that he should concede to their ideas when such a course would have been utterly out of harmony with his divine mission. They looked upon him as in need of their counsel. They judged him from their human point of view and thought that if he would speak only such things as would be acceptable to the scribes and the Pharisees, he would avoid the disagreeable controversy that his words aroused. They thought that he was beside himself in claiming divine authority and in placing himself before the rabbis 
as a reprover of their sins. They knew that the Pharisees were seeking occasion to accuse him, and they felt that he had given them sufficient occasion. With their short measuring line, they could not fathom the mission which he came to fulfill, and therefore could not sympathize with him in his trials. Their coarse, unappreciative words showed that they had no true perception of his character and did not discern that the divine blended with the human. They often saw him full of grief and st but instead of comforting him, their spirit and words only wounded his heart. His sensitive nature was tortured. His motives were misunderstood. His work was uncomprehended. His brothers often brought forward the philosophy of the Pharisees, which was fair, bare, and horny with age, and presumed to think that they could teach him who understood all truth and comprehended all mysteries. They felt condemned that that which they could not understand. Their reproaches probed him to the quick and his soul was wearied and distressed. They avowed faith in God and thought they, they were vindicating God when God was with them in the flesh and they knew him not. These things made his path a thorny one to travel. So pained was Christ by the misapprehension of it in his own home that it was a relief to him to go where it did not exist. There was one home that he loved to visit, the home of Lazarus and Mary and Martha, for in the atmosphere of faith and love his spirit had rest. Yet there were none on earth who could comprehend his divine mission or know the burden which he bore in behalf of humanity. Often he could find relief only in being alone and communing with his Heavenly Father. Those who are called to suffer for Christ's sake, who have to endure misapprehension and distrust, even in their own home, may find comfort in the thought that Jesus has endured the same. He is moved with compassion for them. He bids them find companionship in Him and relief, once He found it, in communion with the Father. Those who accept Christ as their personal Savior are not left as orphans to bear the trials of life alone. He receives them as members of the heavenly family. He bids them call his father their father. They are his little ones, dear to the heart of God, bound to him by the most tender and abiding ties. He has toward them an exceeding tenderness, as far as surpassing what our father or mother has felt toward us in our helplessness as the divine is above the human. Of Christ's relation to his people, there is a beautiful illustration in the laws given to Israel when through poverty a Hebrew, a Hebrew had been forced to part with his patrimony and to sell himself as a bond servant. The, the duty of redeeming him and his inheritance fell to the one who was nearest of kin. So the work of redeeming us and our inheritance, lost through sin, fell upon him who is near of kin unto us. It was to redeem us that he became our kinsman, closer than father, mother, brother, friend, or lover is the Lord our Savior. Fear not, he says, for I've redeemed thee, I've called thee by thy name, thou art mine. Since thou was precious in my sight, thou hast been honorable, and I've loved thee. Therefore will I give men for thee, and people for thy life. Christ loves the heavenly beings that surround his throne. 
But what shall account for the great love wherewith He has loved us? We cannot understand it, but we can know it true in our own experience. And if we do hold the relation of kinship to Him, with what tenderness should we regard those who are brethren and sisters of our Lord? Should we not be quick to recognize the claims of our divine relationship? adopted into the family of God, should we not honor our father and our kindred?